going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is uh, our text for the day. We're continuing our study in the, the book of Romans. We've been in it a while. We're, we still got a ways to go. So I uh, hope you've been enjoying it. I hope you'll stick with us. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Uh, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,123, and you will find the book of Romans. You'll find our text for the day. And, and as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, hey, speaking of change, it, it is a, a seasonal change because tomorrow morning uh, all the public schools are open and all the kids are back in school and uh, Calvary Christian Academy started back on Thursday, so uh, they've already been in school a couple of days. Kids, are you excited that school's starting? <laughs> Parents, are you excited that school's starting? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the way it is. It's a day of mourning for some, a day of rejoicing for others, but... But it is, it is a season to change, and, uh, and so I just wanted to invite you, if you're newer here or you've been coming a while checking us out, but you haven't connected uh, yet, uh, we've got Intro to Calvary next Saturday. Love for you to uh, come on the afternoon. It's here on this campus and find out more about who we are, what we do, what we believe, how we operate. Uh, it's just a great way to, uh, uh, to take that new step in commitment and be a part of the family here at Calvary. So how many of you have ever been so afraid you couldn't move? Okay, some of your hands are okay. I don't know what it is that, that uh, paralyzed you with fear. Maybe it was the sight of a snake. Or maybe you uh, heard a noise when you were home alone. And you're like, what was that? Or, or maybe you watched a scary movie and in the middle of the night you need to go to the bathroom but you were too afraid to get out of bed. You know, you remember being a kid, being so afraid, and if you're in bed, you just pull the covers up and like, I hope it doesn't kill me. I don't want to see it if it's going to. Uh, so, you know, fear has that impact on us. And spiritual fear can have the same effect. I mean, we can become so paralyzed uh, by fear, uh, whether we're fear, afraid of failing God or afraid of making a mistake or making a wrong decision or embarrassing God or... Uh, a fear that I've heard expressed by a lot of Christians, a lot more than I wanted to, just a fear of losing their salvation and going to hell. And, uh, and fear can paralyze us. It steals our joy. It robs us of the courage that God wants us to have. And so I don't know what fear you face. I don't know what kind of uh, uh, fears invade or harass or control your life. But I do know this. God doesn't want us living in fear. He doesn't want us to live afraid. It, it stops us from serving Christ. It stops us from representing Jesus the way that he wants to be represented in our homes and our communities. And, and so today we're going to continue our discussion of security. Because God wants us secure, confident, boldly following Jesus. We, we started this conversation last week in the passage immediately preceding this one. We're continuing it this week. Uh, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Here's what the Apostle Paul says to the church in Rome. He says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with Jesus graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, this passage is oozing with security and assurance and a call for us to be confident in Christ. And so today, uh, we're continuing the study of security. We're talking about it again. We're going to examine three more statements of security. 
Now, as I get ready to, to share these statements, just understand these are statements made for followers of Jesus Christ. So if you're here and you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to following Jesus with your life, then these statements of security apply to you. Now, if you haven't yet made that commitment to follow Jesus, uh, then listen in because this is what is waiting for you when you decide to take that step and make uh, that commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, the first statement of security is simply this. God is for you. God is for you. I love verse 31. I hope you caught that. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? See, I want you to understand God doesn't hate you. God isn't mad at you. He's not angry at you. He doesn't want you to fail. Some of you feel like, now God must really be upset with me. He must be uh, against me because I, I've, you know, I, I've sinned over and over and over again. I, I keep having these, these times when I, when I say I'm not going to do it again, and I do it again, and I, and I feel like a failure, and I know that God's not happy with me. And, and I want you to understand that Scripture says God is for you. And the apostle puts it in a form of a question. If God is for us, who can be against us? And what he's really saying is, look, if God is for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. And when he formed that question, he knew some of the answers that would come to the minds of his readers. He knew that the Roman government, the, the empire, was against them. This was just at the beginning phases when they started doing empire-wide persecutions of Christians. Uh, the, the local authorities had been against the Apostle Paul, and they oftentimes were against Christians in, in those communities, and, and they were beaten and put in prison. The, the Jewish leaders were against Paul. He was on his way to Jerusalem, and, and when he got there, he'd end up in prison, and they were trying to kill him. So when he said that, he knew there were people who were against them, but he's saying, who cares? God is for us. God is for you. And God being for you is demonstrated by Jesus. He demonstrated, he proved it by Jesus. Look at verse 32. God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He gave him up for us all. He sacrificed his own son so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be included and adopted into his family. And, and that is a dramatic affirmation from God. I mean, think about this. Uh, every time we observe communion, we're remembering God's love for us. We're going to celebrate communion later in the service, and we're going to give you a time to reflect on that. And, and I want you to reflect on the fact that God loved you enough to sacrifice his son for you. To pay the price for your sins so that you could be his child and, he could, and you could live your life knowing that God is for you. So whenever you wonder, is God really for me? Think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. Think about how much God is for you because honestly, uh, he's for you more than anybody else that exists. Because, you know, let me just be honest. I'm for you. I, I want all of you to be blessed by God. I want you to succeed. I want you to be happy. Uh, I want all that stuff for you. Uh, but I, I'm not for you that much. Can I, can I just be, you know, just really gut level honest? Uh, I'm not about to sacrifice one of my daughters for you. Yeah, grandchildren? Let's not even go there, Okay. Not even going to be in the conversation. It's not happening. And, you know, and if it's like, hey, sorry, you have to sacrifice your child so I can live, I'll preach your funeral. But, uh, <laughs> and, and look, I, I care about you, but I, not that much. God did the unimaginable. He did the insane. He, he did the unthinkable. He sacrificed his child for you so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be in his family. Uh, and, and so I, I want you to understand he did it for you. God is for you. So be confident and secure that the God of creation loves you and wants to bless you. So he demonstrated that he is for you in Jesus, and then he made a crazy promise. This is how much God is for you. Listen, to, finish out verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him, with Jesus, graciously give us all things? Now, that's a crazy promise. God's going to give us all things. And some of us like, oh, yeah, what does that mean? Because there's a lot of things I want. Well, if you look at the whole passage, it doesn't mean that God promises you that you're going to be healthy or have an abundance of wealth or live in comfort. 
Because if you just take that one phrase out of context, you're going to go like, oh, okay, God's going to give me all these things. But look down at verse 35 and 36 again. Because who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Those aren't the kind of things that we want. But he's going to give us all things. What, what is he saying? Well, verse 36 is a quote from Psalm 44. It, the psalm is a psalm of lament, and the psalmist, when he's writing it, he's praising God for God's greatness and, and the way that he delivered Israel in the past, the Exodus event, uh, the conquest of the land, uh, pretty much the stories of Exodus and Deuteronomy and Joshua. And then he declares his own faithfulness to God. God, I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. And then he laments the suffering of God's people, the shame and sorrow that they are in, asking for God to do something. And, and verse 35 is quite descriptive. Tribulation, distress, persecution. Doesn't sound like the promise that you're always going to be healthy, does it? Famine, nakedness, danger, no promise of wealth there. In fact, none of it sounds comfortable. How do we understand the fact that God's going to give us all things, he's for us, and yet the stuff we want isn't the stuff we're going to get? All right. How many of you in this room have ever been a child? <laughs> right, okay, it's all of us. So think back now, if you can, to when you were a child of seven or eight or nine, okay? And if you had parents of anything like mine at all, there were times that I wanted stuff, and they said, no, yeah, the, the favorite parental answer, right? They said, no, they didn't give me the stuff I wanted. And, and at those moments when I wasn't getting what I wanted, it did not feel like my parents were for me. And there were times that my parents made us do chores. In fact, that's pretty much all the time. And, uh, it, you know, they always had a to-do list. It was, like, way too long. And, and so, they, they, you know, we had chores to do all the time. And when I was in the midst of doing chores and I wanted to play, but I had to do chores, I, I can just be honest, I did not feel like my parents were for me. Not at all. And then there were those moments of discipline. Right? Now, I don't know about you guys, but I had parents that believed in corporal punishment, and they believed in it with a zeal. And, uh, and so there were a lot of times when, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, I might get, uh, you know, a whooping. And, and at those moments in time, I was not thinking, wow, my parents really love me. They are really for me. And I've got evidence of that. None of those times did I think my parents were for me. Did I feel like my parents were for me? But from this vantage point now, I understand. They, they were teaching me a work ethic, whether I wanted to learn it or not. They were teaching me that life does not always give you what you want. And they were teaching me that, you know, there are consequences for actions. So choose well. In other words, the entire time that I didn't feel like my parents were for me, they were actually for me. You see, God's our Father. And we're the children. And there's a lot of times in our lives that we're asking God for something and he's saying no. And we're asking God to, to do something and he doesn't do it. And we don't feel like God is for us. But he is. He's for us. So what are these things that God is giving us that are going to provide security for us? Uh, that are all these things with Jesus. What is it he's going to give us? Well, okay, how about grace instead of judgment. God's going to give us grace instead of judgment. Look at verses 33 and 34. Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Understand, if there's anyone who's going to condemn us, who's going to judge us, it is God. Jesus has the right to pass judgment on us, but instead of passing judgment on us, you know what he's doing? He's interceding for us. He's asking for mercy because he's given us mercy. I mean, so this is how God is for us, that even though every one of us in this room deserve hell, we get heaven because of grace, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that instead of condemning us, he's given us life and mercy. Well, I mean, that sounds like a really good deal to me, so I'm going to go on. So God's giving us grace instead of judgment, and he's given us the kingdom with Jesus. 
If you look back at, uh, you know, kind of to the left on your, on your Bible, verse 17, and if we're children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. We get the kingdom with Jesus. This is part of the all things with Jesus that we're getting, and, and that means that we're inheriting it all. But remember, it's not of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. Jesus was really clear. He looked at Pilate in the eyes and said, my followers are not going to fight because my kingdom's not of this world. It's not the stuff. It's not the temporal stuff that God wants us to focus on. It's the eternal things. And we're sharing in all of that. So we have an inheritance that's crazy. So we get grace instead of judgment. We get the kingdom with Jesus. And we get eternal life beyond compare. Eternal life beyond compare. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is, is to be revealed to us. In other words, Paul says, look, you're, you're going through a lot. I'm going through a lot. This world hurts. Sometimes it doesn't feel like God's for us. But in the end, we get heaven. You know what, you know what that means? Heaven is described in Revelation as a place where there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain. <laughs> Amen. On top of that, you know what? We get new bodies. <laughs> yeah, so, some of you that are in chronic pain are like, I'm ready. Let's upgrade now. You know, this, this is her. And if, the older you get, the more you realize that is a really cool promise. You know, the kids don't get it. You know, they don't understand. I like, they like the bodies they have. But see, you know, I don't know about you, but I can live with these promises. I mean, the promise of forgiveness, the promise of an amazing inheritance, the promise of heaven, that no matter what we're facing today, the best is yet to come. So be secure because God is for you. He's for you. And be secure because you're more than a conqueror. Verse 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through Christ who loved us. We're more than conquerors. Now, that's a funny placement of that verse because right in front of it, it talks about we're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So how do I feel like I'm more than a conqueror when I've just been told that I'm going to be slaughtered like sheep? I mean, it is kind of an awkward transition, isn't it? You know, here, here is a psalm of lament and suffering, and then you're a conqueror. And, and if you look at the context of this verse, of this passage, you have to go, hey, this is all about our unchangeable identity in Christ. This is all about our unchangeable, our unalterable identity in Christ. If you're a Jesus follower, and we already talked about what that means. If you're a Jesus follower, then who do you live for? Okay, some of you are like, I'll say it quietly. No, I'm really, if you're, if you're a Jesus follower, who are you going to live for? Jesus. Okay, you're living for Jesus. Who is your hope in? Jesus. Okay, it's in Jesus. So, uh, it, who is your salvation because of? Jesus. Jesus. So if all that's true, if you're living for Jesus, your hope is in Jesus, your eternal life is because of Jesus, then our identity is in? It's in Jesus. That's what it means to be a Jesus follower, is that your identity is connected to Jesus. And, and that means that we need to understand, if Jesus wins, we win. That, that's the relationship. So did Jesus win? Yes, he did. He defeated sin, he defeated death, he defeated hell. He, he purchased our redemption with his blood. He, he has the name that is above every name. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the unconquerable hero. He is way more than uh, uh, any conqueror could ever be. And we belong to him. And so we have one with him. More than conquerors. Now, here's the hardest question. How did Jesus win? It's what he did, but how did he actually seal the victory? He died on the cross. In other words, see, we're not, we're not really excited about that answer. You know, in just a moment ago, we're like, Jesus, yeah, name of, above all names, King of kings, Lord of lords, conqueror. How did he get there? He died. Right? On the cross, one of the last words was, it is finished. A cry of victory, and then he died. And we're way less excited about that. 
See, it's much easier to cheer, you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, name above all names. Yeah, all that great stuff. It's hard, great to talk about heaven and we get all excited. But the, the reality is Jesus won the victory through the cross and the grave. And then he says to us, follow me. Follow me to victory. And we want the victory, but we don't always want to pay the price. But our identity is in Jesus, and that means that the goal is to be faithful to Jesus. If your identity is in Jesus, then the goal is to be faithful to Jesus. That means our goal is not survival. Our goal is not survival. See, sometimes the world talks about, well, the thing we have to do is we have to live longer. We always have to live longer. We got to make sure. The worst thing that can happen is, is that you don't live longer. So we're always about, you know, elongating life, trying to keep, keep people alive. And, and yet, if we believe that the best is yet to come, staying alive is subordinate to faithfulness to Jesus. And we've got brothers and sisters around the world right now that it's dangerous to bear the name of Jesus. So when we baptize somebody, we shout and clap and holler and want to make it as public as possible, and they have to do it in secret because it's a death sentence. And, and that means that the goal is not material blessings and comfort. I mean, we want to have enough. We, 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 you know, we want to bless our kids and our families, but uh, the truth is, if you're faithful, you might have those things and you might not. Because what does it profit a man or his family if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? And the goal is not applause or prestige or status in the eyes of the world. At some point, the applause of the world for those who are faithful to Jesus will stop. It will end. And you've got to answer the question about whose affirmation is more important to you. The applause of man that when it stops, it's just silence. Or the affirmation of God. Because when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, it echoes for eternity. You see, as more than conquerors, our goal is to be faithful to Jesus, even if it costs us our comfort, our status, our wealth, and even our lives. We're followers of Jesus, following him to victory. And again, his path to victory included the cross and the grave. And he calls us to not be afraid, to embrace our identity with Jesus and, and to follow him and trust him, knowing that he has us. Knowing that we're going to win. In fact, it is impossible for us to lose because of Jesus. So we can be secure because God is for us and because we are more than conquerors and because nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing can separate you from God's love. I hope you heard this. Verse 38, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So according to the Apostle Paul, none of these things can separate us. So can, can dying separate you from the love of God? Okay, can living separate you from the love of God? Even if you live poorly? See, no. That, that's what he says. Can any of these things? What about, what about uh, you know, spiritual beings, whether they're good or bad, angels or demons, can they separate you from the love of God? No. Can governments separate you from the love of God? No, see, it, it, what about today or tomorrow? Can that separate you from the love of God? No. And I love it because he, when he's like, I, he has this list. He's going, I, this can't, this can't. Ah, the heck with it. Nothing in all of creation. Let's just go there. Can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's amazing. That, that's life-changing. And, and so here's what that means. If you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, that's forever. It's forever. If you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Notice I didn't say if you join the right church, or if you get baptized, or if you live a good life, or if you say a prayer. 
It's a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So do you know that there is no condemnation in your life because of Jesus? Do you know that you've been adopted as a son or a daughter of God? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is in you? Do you know that God's causing all things to work together for good because you love him? You see, have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ? Because if you know that you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus, then live securely, live confidently. Nothing can or will ever separate you from the love of God. Now, if you know Jesus and you're living in that fear of losing your salvation, can I just encourage you to please stop? To be confident, to listen to God's word. To, if you need to, just, you know, read this every day, multiple times throughout the day until it burns into your soul and you trust God because he's telling you here, look, if you know me, you've got this relationship forever. Now, if you're sitting here and you're pretty confident in your salvation because somebody else told you you're okay, whether that's a pastor or a vacation Bible school teacher or your parents or your grandparents, then I would like for you to kind of double check and make sure that you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Don't take somebody else's word for it. This is your decision. Now, every time I teach on this, somebody asks a question like this. Yeah, pastor, but what about sinners? You know, what about sinners? What about those people that, you know, say they love Jesus and then they, they just abuse grace. They just mess up. They just, what about them? Well, the easy answer is, we're all sinners. We all abuse grace. Every one of us who knows Jesus and loves Jesus still chooses, to, at least at times, to disobey. Now, I'll just talk about me. Look, I, I do it. I abuse grace. Look, I, I want to follow Jesus. I want to love Jesus. I, I want to serve Jesus. I want to do that. And then there's moments where I just don't. Okay? I'm just being honest. There's times I go, yeah, I, I shouldn't do this, but I do it anyway. Kind of like when you're looking at the pizza and going, should I have the seventh piece of pizza or not? <laughs> I know I shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. Or when you're like, yeah, that ice cream is good. I think I'm going to go back for thirds. <laughs> and everybody around you is going, don't do it. And you're like, I'm doing it anyway. I'm going to pay for it later. I don't care. I want to do it. And, and inside, your mind's screaming, don't do it. You know it's wrong. You know you don't want to do it. And you do it anyway. All of us abuse grace. We're sinners. We're, we're attached to the sin nature that's in our bodies. That's why we get new bodies, because these are corrupt. And, and people go, yeah, okay, I get that. But what about the bad sinners? You know, what about the people who say they're Christians and then they're grossly promiscuous or they're serious addicts or they're dealing drugs or they claim to be atheists now or they've joined a cult? What about them? Well, the Bible gives us two clear answers. Um, they're in one of two camps. They're either a prodigal or a pretender. Prodigals are pretenders. Prodigals are talked about by Jesus in Luke chapter 15 when he's talking about the grace of God, the amazing grace of God. Uh, if you don't know the story, uh, please read it. Uh, go home, Luke 15. And, and uh, here's the story in a nutshell. You know, this arrogant, rebellious son demands his inheritance before dad dies, which is kind of rude. And dad actually gives it to him. And he goes to a faraway land, and he lives a life that is anti-dad. I mean, he just rebels against everything his dad stands for. He runs out of money. He gets to a desperate place, finally decides to go home and begged to be a servant. Dad receives him as a son, restores him, rejoices with him, welcomes him, embraces him. Uh, there are people who choose to be prodigals. And they spend a season, whether that season is a month or a year or a decade or 40 years, living in rebellion against the father but eventually they come home. And when they come home, the father receives them as children. And then there's pretenders. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, the apostle says this. He says, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would not have gone out from us. You know what he's saying? He actually, is, it's in a passage where he's talking about people who are, who are antichrists. 
They're, they're living opposite Christ. He said they, they came in, they looked like they were part of us, they joined with us, they, they talked like us, they acted like us, but they weren't of us. They were religious, but they never had that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And he said, so they didn't know him. They weren't changed. So here's the catch. People can be prodigals, they can be pretenders, but you and I don't know the difference from the outside. You and I can't see anybody's heart. You know whose heart we, un- we can see and we can know? Our own. That's it. You can't see my heart. I can't see your heart. That's why we're not supposed to judge one another because we really don't know what's going on inside. But God knows and you know. So if you're sitting here and you're a prodigal, it's time to come home. You've been living in rebellion. The Father is waiting for you to come home. He loves you and he wants to embrace you and he wants to bless you again. If you're sitting here and you're a pretender and you know it, you've just been trying to be good enough, hoping you can be good enough, trying to be, hang out with good people and, and be religious, then today would you surrender to Christ? Would you stop playing the game and get real with God and ask Jesus to change your life? Because he'll do it. You see, God is for us, and we're conquerors because of Jesus. And nothing, nothing can separate you from God's love if you know him. Will you pray with me?